Hello guys, welcome back to Not Just Make Art. It's Marco here, and today we talk about the golden high flow line of acrylic paints. During Christmas I added a new set of paints to my collection and after two months of experiments, some of which you have already seen in my last few videos, I'm ready to share with you my thoughts about how they fit our process and our very specific kind of paint jobs. Miniature painting changed a lot in the last few years, thanks in particular to the realization that we can create real art in this bizarre little medium. This idea changes everything, because if your goal is to make art, you start thinking like an artist, and you suddenly become open to fine art concepts, techniques, and of course materials. Companies like Chimera and Scale75 immediately understood this paradigm shift, creating new amazing tools that really close the gap between hobby and artist paints, but they are just two products, and is nothing compared to the variety you can find in fine art paints. But before going on, it's really important for me to make this clear. You can fully leave this hobby at its highest with just 10 colors and a single brush. The point is not that you need this kind of stuff, but that you have the choice to use it. The choice to enter any art shop of the world and come out with something new, interesting, and sometimes mind-blowing. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button to always know what happens on the channel. And if you want to support my work, check my Patreon page and join the community. Golden High Flow is a set of 49 acrylic colors, including fluorescent and iridescent paints, made with the same ingredients of the other Golden Artist paint lines. Here I have the whole range, minus a few tones that were out of stock in my local art shop, but I never buy the metallic tones. In my experience metallic paints are the main and constant weak spot of any artist line, because their pigments have a size made to sell the shiny effect on the large scale of a canvas, so they never really work on miniatures, looking more like fat glitters. They come in dropper bottles with a super safe cap, from which you can finely regulate the flow of paint. And they all have already an agitator ball inside. The tubes have a different price depending mostly on the pigment they are made of, and on average they cost twice as much as a citadel pot, but you get a 30ml bottle, so almost three times the quantity of a GW color. The line is organized in two subcategories, the opaque tones with a white cap, and the transparent colors with a transparent tip. As we'll see better later, the difference between the two is subtle in a single application, but when you start building up layers, the difference in opacity becomes much more evident. As you can see here on the label, they are made to be used with a brush, markers, dip pens, or the airbrush as they are, directly from the bottle. You don't need to add or do anything else to obtain the behavior you see here. This is real paint from the same batch that ends up in the bottle, so you know the basic behavior of every pot or tube when they are still in the shop's rack. You can even feel the texture and check the final finish. I play a lot with these features in my paint jobs, and being able to tell these properties before leaving the shop has been a real game changer for me. Then you have the name of the color, it's real, technical, academic name, so you can easily match the U with other lines or even other brands. Miniature companies are still uh, extremely afraid of this possibility, so they give you silly made-up names uh, to keep you bound to their brand. And if you want to go deeper and be able to match even better your tones, uh, you can check the code of the pigment used to make this color. This also gives you the information that only one pigment is used to make uh, most of the basic use. As you know from my sketching and mixing series, this is super important when you use a color to create your own mixes, because single pure pigments give you stable results, easy to recreate over and over, while mysterious combinations can lead only to mysterious and unpredictable results. If the tone is a mixture, you can still check the pigments here in the back, and do the chromatic math. The little squares tell you a more precise indication of the general opacity or transparency of the color, and this same system is used on any artist paint, even oil paints for example. White square means uh, transparent, white with a line is uh, semi-transparent, half white half black is semi-opaque, close to semi-transparency but uh, more on the side of opacity, and full black means opaque. This core here represents the light fastness of the paint, 
A property of a color or pigment that describes how resistant to fading it is when exposed to light. This is an aspect of paint that's totally alien to the miniature world, but is extremely important considering that we plan to have our models on the shelf for a very long time, not to mention display figures and dioramas. You can also check the Golden website to find all this information in a single chart and easily find what you need. It is crazy how much stuff we decide to not be aware of in our hobby. Compared to the load of information you get from these labels, a classic pot of hobby paint is basically a blind box. The paint's consistency is not a surprise. It's extremely fluid, almost like an ink, just a tiny bit less watery. They have already inside additives such as flow improvers, film levelers and retarders to create a very thin and free-flowing paint, able to set in a uniform smooth coat. This paint has a beautiful surface tension that makes it easy to load in the brush and finally control the flow out of the tip. You can feel from the brush that uh, it has been tested for calligraphy. In general, I find these colors a bit easier to handle compared to inks, that often tend to move and drip down with a simple pull of gravity. Ooh, and they produce more uniform layers. Thanks to their high concentration of pigments, the colors are incredibly saturated, vibrant and brilliant, reaching almost the saturation of opaque inks that are my gold standard for these features. And they maintain these properties even adding a ton of water or spreading them in a super thin, transparent layer. They are made with finely ground pigments, so the suspension is extremely stable, and this helps reducing uh, clogging issues in small tips and airbrush nozzles. Here I'm using the 0.15 nozzle of my Infinity with paint straight from the bottle, and everything works super smoothly. Reviewing the high flow line simply says uh, hairbrush paint, I put it in the perfect middle between uh, Molotov paints and Inks contrast paints. Molotov are made for street art, so crazily resistant, opaque and extremely matte, and that's why I like to use them as color primers. While Inks are transparent and with a satin glossy finish, perfect to refine shadows, add saturation and create interesting effects playing with the finish of different paints. But these are two extremes difficult to connect, and I really needed something ready to use for all the applications in between. But here is the reason that really made me decide to make this video. I bought these colors to save time when airbrushing, and lazily fill a gap in the commission painting a speedy workflow. But in these two months, I use them mostly with the brush. I didn't even plan to show them in video because I didn't want to give you the idea that you need something this technical and specific for airbrushing, but I soon discovered that they work like a charm with my way of painting, based on the two extremes of super thick paint for sketches and super transparent paint for refining. Because of their general transparency and fluid consistency, they are obviously a long way from being all-purpose paints, but they are crazily good for every technique that involves transparency and fluidity. Glazes, filters, washes, wet-on-wet -wet techniques, grisaille, they all become faster and easier to do. The same uh, flow improvers, film levelers and retarders that uh, make them great for airbrushing make also them easy to use with these techniques that need uh, slow drying, watery, transparent layers still with a strong and uniform grab on the surface. Just add water and you are good to go. They dry a bit slower than standard acrylics and uh, when mixed with other colors they can influence their drying time. But when dry they have the classic strength and stability of acrylics, even if applied in uh, thin layers, and the finish tends to be quite matte. In conclusion, if you like to paint with thick paint and layers, the high flow range is probably a situational tool that remains confined in airbrushing applications, and you can jump directly to the amazing heavy body range, but if your workflow is based on any kind of transparency effect, it can become an invaluable aid to get immediately the behavior you want without the need of adjusting the paint with mediums and other products. Here is also an interesting idea. If you are in trouble understanding the dilution for airbrushing or glazing, for example, grab a couple of bottles and use them as reference for your own mixes. 
I suggest a light opaque tone for the test with the airbrush, and a dark transparent hue for glazing and filters, so you have the two extremes that are usually the difficult part of each approach. If you like this video, give it a like and subscribe! Remember that you can ask me anything down below with a comment, and you can follow my projects during the week using one of my socials. And if you want to support the channel and my work, check my Patreon page and join the community, or maybe ask for a commission! See you next week, guys!